As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Presence, all our fears 
are washed away Washed away So uh, welcome to Palm Sunday Worship in the Stanford Circuit. We, <laughs> I guess if we'd all been meeting uh, together in worship live, we might be holding one of these. I don't know if you still got one. My mum used to keep them for years in, in like a pot on the mantelpiece, uh, a little collection of palm crosses. Uh, they are symbols, as we know, of them stripping the, the, the palm leaves and placing them in honour before the coming king who they adored on Palm Sunday. So let's just honour Jesus now as we come to pray to him. Let's pray. Jesus, blessed are you. You come in the name of the Lord. We thank you that you come to our midst now and that if we were not praising Jesus said, well, then the stones themselves would cry out. All creation praises his name, heaven and earth. Join in that chorus and we, by our willing participation today, say, blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. We thank you for the crowds that surrounded you as you came in humbly on a colt, on a donkey. And we pray that as we know how the crowd veered from um, adulation and adoration to shouting out your condemnation, Forgive us when we veer away from you ourselves. And when you come to us, we move back. We are unsure of our commitment. We are unsure how much we care and love you. Forgive us, Lord, and restore us with your Holy Spirit. Come on this Palm Sunday and march into our lives more fully, in a more real way that we may honour you in Holy Week, looking to that cross and remembering what it cost and then rejoicing past it to your mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. Lord, come. We know you come humbly that in a way you kneel at our feet, requesting that we be yours. Come and wash us. Come and fill us today, we pray on this Palm Sunday, on every Sunday, for your sake we pray. Amen.
when fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorns some moment when the moon was blood then surely i was born with a monstrous head and a sickening cry and ears like errant wings the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things the tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will yes starve scourge deride me i am dumb i keep my secret still fools for i also had my hour one far fierce hour and sweet there was a shout about my ears and palms around my feet okay here's my palm cross as i already said here's another cross i made this at um ketton messy church way back when and perhaps you can see it you can see that i've you know, it's one of these ones you scratch and the colors come through and, and so on and i've got on it the crown of thorns and the nails sort of some lightning coming down as well there and some tears maybe maybe tears maybe blood this is a different kind of cross to the palm cross isn't it this reminds us of what jesus went through for us and alex from stanford is now going to read to us from philippians chapter 2 and this you know like we remember jesus humbly coming in on a donkey on a colt here we hear his humility in its full story and how we should be like him in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 verses 3 to 11. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father.
So as we come to think about the uh, gospel lesson, and it's sort of echoing in Philippians 2, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you you came to us. We thank you you came at all. You didn't have to. But we thank you in the way you came. And the manner in which you saved us. Help us to reflect deeply on that as we come into Holy Week now. Bless you for all you have done for us. And help us to listen to your voice. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're on a road map, aren't we? Yes, we're on a road map um, to uh, unlocking. Uh, and one of the things we're going to be able to do, if it all goes to plan, is on April the 12th, we'll be able to go outdoors at um, uh, places of hospitality and, and have a, a, a bit of food and a drink. So let's see how that might all work out. Good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to Anne McAlpine for sending me that video uh, onwards in Facebook. Um, yeah, well, we've known, haven't we, in this last year or so, what it means to be disappointed. I don't mean about the tragedy of the thing. Goodness me, that's been enormous. But I mean, the kind of hopes. Oh, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, uh, we might plan this. Oh, that's all come to bits. Um, you know, to quite, the government's been working with such a difficult situation. I know we're apt to criticise, but would we have done any different? You know, in the, some of these situations are unknown. So there were hopes and disappointments. Bill Bailey, one of my favourite uh, uh, comics, he, he says, uh, I am British, he said, and as such, I crave disappointment. <laughs> you sort of know what he means by that, don't you? He says, I go to Argos. Look at the Palace of Dreams. <laughs> he craves disappointment. Um, <laughs> well, Palm Sunday is absolutely shot through with disappointment. It is, isn't it? And I wonder whether in your life, I guess uh, there are in mine, there are disappointments. that we, Some of them we've left very much, you know, hidden and put, put down under the surface. But there are a lot of them, aren't there? Things we hoped for and then they went wrong or they didn't happen or we didn't understand what the timings were and so on. Shot through with disappointment. And this story talks about that. It talks about it in two ways. And then I want to sort of look to the solution, if you like. The first one is what preachers always say. So I'm going to say it because it's true. Uh, it's, a, it's a sort of staple diet of a Palm Sunday. But... The first disappointment centres on the, the attitude of the crowd. They're shouting out, you know, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they are also shouting out, blessed is he who comes in the uh, name of our, uh, sorry, who comes in the kingdom of our father David. And we know what that means, that they're looking to this wonderful arrival as a sign of their liberation from Rome, from oppression, and David's kingdom, the golden boy's kingdom, is going to come in. Um, I once had a strange conversation, well, not strange in one way, but very unusual, uh, with a lady I used to work with. Uh, her name is Becky, and uh, I said I'd drive her home one day. I was going back towards Peterborough, and she lived in March, and uh, so I dropped her near a house, and about five minutes before we got to where I was going to drop her, she suddenly said to me, Phil, because you talk like that, Phil, uh, I always wondered, why did Jesus die? I thought, what? <laughs> what I thought. I mean, what an opportunity. But I've never had anybody say that to me. Why did Jesus die, she asked. And I thought, oh, let's give her the honest answer. The honest answer is that there are two main reasons that Jesus died. One is that he stood up against the power of the world, the Caesars and the Herods and indeed the Pharisees and etc. Uh, and, and he was a threat to their power, to their order, to their system. And they couldn't stand that. 
So they got rid of it. The other reason, which is much more a Good Friday sermon rather than a Palm Sunday sermon, is that uh, we are wrong. We'll come to that. And Jesus had to deal with something much more cosmic, much more integral to us. Why we go wrong and why we need rescuing. You know, that, that we need him, his salvation. But there is that first one, that when, when, when kingdom power, when God power stands up against the worldly powers, they want rid. So no wonder this crowd is crying out. This is what they're shouting. You know, blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the kingdom of our father David. Well, I think I've probably heard people, Christians, say, well, they haven't said it, but they've kind of hinted it, that if we get all the social stuff right, you know, if we get justice right and mercy right and uh, human rights correct and all those things, uh, that the, the kingdom will have arrived. Now, I'm not saying, definitely not, that we shouldn't work towards justice and um, peace and um, you know things to do with the creation and, and so on and so on we should we absolutely should we should be at the center of it but if we think that we when we get all those things right everything will be okay we are in for such a big disappointment because this story of jesus coming into jerusalem on the donkey is a sign to them that this is not just about the the kingdom of their father david no way is it it is a new way and they have to get used to that and in fact they don't get used to it and those who don't who think they that he's failed them on that political level if you like are going to string him up that's what happens if we think that just putting the, the social stuff right, the political stuff right, which we should be at the vanguard uh, of, yeah, okay, if that's all, we're in for a big disappointment from Jesus because he wants to change hearts. And aren't we seeing in this day and age lots of movements for change which are all really worthwhile, but they are not going to work unless we change people's attitudes and that comes from their heart it doesn't come from laws it doesn't come from making restrictions or getting the political stuff right it that's helpful it changes when we will change when we let god change our hearts so the first area of disappointment is all about the crowd and their expectations they were in the wrong place well not wrong they just didn't have the full picture they needed it. Here was a king coming on a donkey. Do you understand? But the other area of disappointment, before we get to, in a sense, the, the root dealing with it, is, is actually, ironically, the problem lies with Jesus himself. It's not really exactly the crowd's fault. <laughs> Uh, here comes Jesus. We don't know if Mark thinks of this as, um, you know, that, that Jesus is, is messianic. We don't know that, really, what, what, what Mark thinks about it. We, we, but we do know that he's picturing the crowd honouring a welcome guest. He is like the super pilgrim coming they know of his work they want to say if he comes into jerusalem things are going to change for the better we will honor him and then in a way he will honor us you know his presence will bring good things to jerusalem does it <laughs> goodness me i mean the first thing apart from having a look around and going home <laughs> But it must have been a bit disappointing in itself that Jesus does after that, is he goes out and he cleanses the temple, doesn't he? You know the story. Whenever he has a conversation with people on authority, he always undermines their authority. No, 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 it's not that, it's this. You know, always doing that. That You know, when he tells the parable of the wicked tenants, goodness me, did they not see what he was saying to them? They are the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the wicked tenants. When the Sadducees uh, come to him about marriage, he says, you don't know the scriptures, you don't know the power of God. I mean, 
<laughs> Goodness me. And then he talks about the temple. The temple's the centre of Jerusalem. It stands for all that they hope for. And he said, yeah, but that won't stand up for long. Tear it down in three days. I wasn't talking about the temple. We know that. But he was he was getting in their face about it. If he's a visitor, then he's a very testy visitor indeed. No wonder they were disappointed. He, by being Jesus, disappointed them. Let me read you. I know I've read this elsewhere. I can't think where I've read it, but such a good little reading from Gerard Hughes. And uh, here's a scenario. OK, I'm just going to read this from the book. Oh, God, why? By Gerard Hughes. He says, uh, imagine you're in your house and the doorbell goes one evening and on answering you discover the visitor is the risen lord himself somehow you know it's him so how do you react what do you do and say do you shut the door on him tell him to come back on sunday presumably you welcome him welcome him in summon him in uh, and summon everyone in the house and find yourself making such ridiculous statements to the lord of all creation as well do make yourself at home everything you have is yours now take a fortnight's leap in your imagination. Jesus has accepted your invitation and come to stay with you. How are things at home now? You remember that disturbing passage in the Gospels where Jesus says, I've come to not bring peace, but a sword to set daughter against mother, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, son against father. The letter to the Hebrews says he's the same yesterday, today and forever. So presumably there may have been a bit of friction around the family table. Some people leaving, slamming doors, possibly the front door, never to return. You invited Jesus to make himself at home, so he's begun inviting his friends to your house. And you remember what people said of his friends in the gospel, how he dined with sinners. And so what kind of people do you see coming to your house? What are the neighbours saying? What's happening to the local property values? Then you decide that you mustn't keep Jesus all to yourself. So you arrange for him to give a talk at your local church. Hmm. You remember that scene in the gospel where he addresses the scribes and Pharisees and chief priests and assures them that the criminals and the prostitutes will be getting into the kingdom of God before they do. Well, he gives the same message. Some of them leave the church. Some withdraw their money. You return home with Jesus, your saviour, who's now become your problem. What are you going to do? You can't throw out the Lord of all creation, can you? So you look around the house and you find a suitable cupboard. You clear it out, you decorate it, sparing no expense. Get a good strong lock on it and put Jesus inside. And outside you have a lamp and flowers. And each time you pass, you bow reverently. So that you now have Jesus and he doesn't interfere anymore. Hmm. If we miss this point, we're going to miss what Good Friday means. You see, Jesus shows us how we are by being himself. And that doesn't mean all, all loving and sweet, does it? It means being himself. He shows up all our prejudices and our inner problems, our sin. You know, it says it was my sin that put him there. That's what we sing in a hymn, don't we? Do we believe that? And Jesus in that sense, in that sense, is a disappointment because he is Jesus. And we've got to sort of bring ourselves to him and say, and it's not about me, what I want. It's about how you are. And I must follow you. Everything you have, all that you are. I must give myself to you. What I finally want to say is this, that when we look to the cross, well, the cross means so many things, doesn't it? So we can preach on that forever. But if you look at it from a Palm Sunday perspective, the cross is the place where our disappointments are dealt with. If we come, if we bring them there. You see, the cross has come to us to be something very glorious and wonderful. We know it's savage and it's tragic in one way, 
but it's also the place of enormous disappointment. If you think about the few disciples that are just watching this, they, even they're not sure what it's about. You hear those two on the road to Emmaus. Oh, we thought he was the one. But what's the bottom line of that? But he wasn't. So we're now we're just disappointed in everything. When we come to the cross, it is a place of gathering our disappointments. And Jesus is saying, this place is a gateway to hope. The cross is a place of a gateway to hope. It looks like a tragedy. It looks like a malfunction. It looks like a miscarriage. But in fact, it's not. It's the place of new beginnings. Bring me your disappointments. Bring me your struggles. Yes, at the cross, they make sense and they are redeemed. And then the power of Easter Sunday comes. Adrian Plass has a story about how he wants uh, hired a skip, as people do, to clear out stuff from his house and garage and garden, whatever it was. And uh, as you might expect, in his road, uh, when he got up the next morning, having put his skip in, a lot of people decided they're going to chuck some of their stuff in his skip as well. He's really cross about this. He said, like, oh, "Wait a minute! I, I, it's my skip." And then he felt a voice, a little voice in his head, said to him, "Do you want to come and see a human skip?" He said, "Pop." And in, this, in his mind, Adrian was taken up to the hill of Calvary and made to look by Jesus at the cross. He said, that's what a human skip looks like. Where we throw all the things that are rubbish and bad and wrong and can be redeemed. You're fussing about your skip, says God. I took everything, everybody's rubbish, onto me. All your disappointments all your failings, all your sins on his back, on his whipped back, put right for you. So what are you shouting out from the crowd at Palm Sunday? Give us a new start in our community, Lord. Sort out the government. <laughs> sure. Sort me out, Lord. That's what I want to shout. Save me. Save me, Prince of Peace, you who are blessed and come in the name of the Lord. We're going to turn to prayer now. And I'm really glad that Viv Angeli uh, from Ketton Methodist Church has come and do our prayers. And so Viv's going to lead us in our prayers for other people. So let's pray with Viv. Our prayers of intercession for today, Palm Sunday. Let us pray. In our gospel passage today, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey. And in this powerful moment, we recognise and come face to face with the humility of our Lord, Jesus, the servant King. And so it is, we come face to face with the reality of how we live our lives today loving and serving our God in the way that Jesus, our humble servant King, taught us. The crowd laid down their cloaks and palms before Jesus to praise and sing, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. Humbly now before God, we lay down our prayers of concern for others, knowing that our Lord will hear our prayer. Who could have known one year ago how much our lives would change as the pandemic gripped the world. In spite of everything and the trauma of the past year that has affected every single soul, there is still so much that we want to praise and thank God for. We are blessed with the most amazing NHS for their skills, their dedicated care and their compassion in unbelievable and unimaginable situations as they care for patients. So we praise and thank God for our medical teams. But we pray too for the mental health of all our frontline workers, the medics, carers and their families, as they emerge slowly from the trauma of what they have witnessed in the past year. And we pray for all those who have supported them on that journey. We praise and thank you for our church fellowship, 
and for all those who lead, guide and support us, spiritually and pastorally. We pray for our families and communities, so many coming together in the best way possible to support each other. And if there's one thing we have learned and responded to in this pandemic, it is the kindness and generosity that we've witnessed among neighbours and communities. As one of our hymns speaks to us this morning, brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. We thank God for people and for their servanthood to humanity. Jesus at the heart, teaching and guiding us. But two things came into my heart in preparing these prayers, these prayers, situations which I want to pray for. Fear and anger. Was Jesus fearful of what he was about to face in the week ahead? And what about the fear of the disciples? How much anger emanated from the crowds as they turned on Jesus? And what about the anger in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus calmed? We cannot overlook the pain and sadness of fear and anger that have broken lives. So we remember especially today those lives broken by fear. Fear comes in many cloaks to lay down. Those who are hungry and unsure where the next meal will come from. Those who have lost their homes, their livelihood, their loved ones to illness. And those now so vulnerable after a year of isolation, they may even be fearful of leaving their homes. Heavenly Father, give them the strength and above all hope to face life again with faith and courage, because you, living Lord, will be at the heart of their journey. But above all, help each one of us to see, hear and respond to the needs of others in whatever way we can. And whilst we've been so immersed in this pandemic, we must not forget those places in the world where war, famine, natural disasters and so much more have destroyed lives so tragically. So tragically that refugees and migrants still dangerously travel the globe to find a place of safety. Heavenly Father, we bring these situations to you now and pray for your healing, strength and comfort for those whose lives are broken by fear. And we, we remember those whose lives are broken by anger. We bring our prayerful concern to you now, Lord. Lockdown for so many has brought anger and frustration in many guises. Sometimes, Lord, we know it's right to feel anger at the injustices of the world. And we're right to speak out, to stand up for the oppressed, the marginalised, those without a voice. So many needs in this world that we must speak up for. Heavenly Father, we bring before you now those who struggle with temper and anger issues and the impact this has had on the lives of those around them. In this time of enforced lockdown where families may be exposed to anger and indeed danger, we pray fervently for peace and reconciliation for those who struggle with, those, with anger and for those who witness and suffer at their hands. God of healing, gently touch these lives with your spirit so that calm, healthy relationships within families can be fostered, nurtured and restored. On this Palm Sunday, we remember that God holds each one of us in the palm of his hand. And as we journey with Christ, our humble servant King, to the cross this week, we rejoice in the knowledge of his resurrection, the light and hope he brings for our world. So we draw all our prayers together in the name of our blessed Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks, Viv, for those prayers. We're going to come to our final hymn, which is Graham Kendrick's From Heaven You Came, The Servant King. And this really takes us into Holy Week, doesn't it? And reminds us, you know, there in the garden of tears or hands that flung stars into space to cruel nails surrendered and so on but it also reminds us that this is the humble king this this jesus wasn't just putting on a show in, on palm sunday oh you know it's a bit of a bit of a gag it's a bit of a trick it's not it's who he is he is that humble king and yet he is glorious so we sing his praises and then we'll That'll be the end of the service uh, and God bless you in the Holy Week. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the various meditations that we've got planned for every day for about 10 or 15 minutes in the morning, uh, 10 I think. And uh, please join us there for that and, uh, and make the most of Holy Week, Good Friday and the coming Easter celebrations.
each other's needs to prefer For it is Christ we're serving This is our God, the servant King He calls us now to fall Oh